Hello, this is me, Erika Stahl von Holstein. And this is Luca de Bielse. Welcome to Reimagine Talks, the podcast that is set up to challenge the way we think. And today we're delighted to be here with Professor Enrico Giovannini to challenge one of the most used and useful terms of today, but also possibly one of the most misunderstood. The word is sustainability. Enrico Giovannini is Professor of Economic Statistics at the University of Rome Tor Vergata, where he teaches statistics and analysis and policies for sustainable development. He is co-founder and scientific director of the Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development. He has been chief statistician of the OECD, president of ISTAT, professor of sustainable development at Lewis University. He is a member of the executive committee of the Club of Rome and the Global Happiness Council. He was Minister of Labour and later Minister of Sustainable Infrastructure and Mobility for the Italian government. He worked with the United Nations, the European Commission and the International Labour Organization. He is the author of more than 120 papers, eight books on statistical, economic and political issues, some translated into other languages, and he co-authored some important International Commission reports on the future of work and on European policies for sustainable development. So Enrico, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to joining us here today and to sharing with us your enormous expertise and experience on uh, this issue. As I mentioned previously, and I'm calling in today from Brussels, the word sustainability is used in very many different contexts here and um, is sometimes misunderstood or maybe misappropriate by in, in certain contexts. So I would say, although being one of the most used words, maybe it's also potentially one of the most misunderstood. So before delving deeper, maybe you can share with us what do we actually mean by sustainability and why is it so important? Well, years ago, uh, UN Commission led by the former Norwegian uh, Prime Minister, uh, agreed uh, after a long discussion uh, what uh, means uh, by sustainable development. And uh, uh, they said uh, is sustainable the development that allows the current generation to meet its own needs without prejudging the fact that future generations could do the same. So at the end of the day is uh, an issue of justice, intergenerational justice. It's not just about environment, uh, institutional dimension, or economic problems and social problems. It's all together because without uh, a resilient uh, and effective society, there is no future, no future generations. The same if we don't have uh, efficient uh, institutions. And of course, If we transmit to the next generation a more limited amount of uh, human, social, economic, and natural capital, for them will be much more difficult to meet their own needs. So it's about capital, the different forms of capital. It's about justice. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, Uh, is about our behaviors in order to avoid disasters that are unfortunately already happening, will be happening because in the past we didn't pay enough attention to this concept. Professor, the UN Secretary General said that we are lagging behind on the 2030 agenda. It is likely that there are many reasons for the delay, but What are the most important reasons? At the end of the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012, the conference, UN conference, agreed on a declaration, the future we want, that was then translated into the so-called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is based on 17 sustainable development goals that go from end of poverty, end of hunger, but also uh, decent work, fight against inequalities, uh, including uh, gender inequalities, of course, environmental 
uh, outcomes, and so on and so forth. And these 17 goals are then articulated in 169 targets, which are very concrete. And all members of the UN committed to implement this agenda by 2030. The uh, motto of the agenda is that uh, we shouldn't leave anyone uh, behind. But as the Secretary General said uh, in the recent uh, September 2023 summit on SDGs, the risk is that we are what is lagging behind, what is left behind is the agenda itself. Because uh, after the pandemic, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the growth uh, of uh, inflation, uh, energy crisis, and so on, countries both developed and developing were pushed back. And uh, several of the improvements that were made between 2015 and 2019 disappeared. For example, in terms of uh, poverty, in terms of education, a lot of uh, young people during who left the school during uh, the pandemic didn't go back. Uh, the reduction of uh, inequality stopped because the policies uh, were not uh, adequate in overcoming uh, the increasing inequalities. And now uh, geopolitical tensions are slowing down the agreements on uh, the necessary actions on climate change, on uh, preservation of nature and uh, ecosystems. So is, uh, the 2030 Agenda is at risk. Notwithstanding all these risks, several countries, and uh, including the European Union, uh, made uh, a big, big effort to incorporate the 2030 Agenda in their policies. And from this point of view, the European Union is the best one in terms of uh, policy coherence for sustainable development in other elements, but a lot of work has still to be done. You mentioned before that for you, sustainability um, is really about justice. And also you mentioned all the diverse um, global sustainability goals um, that really show that this is not only about environmental sustainability, but it's also social um, sustainability and economic sustainability. And it's really, to some extent, a mind shift away from how we used to think about things to really um, think differently about them. You also mentioned that recently we've had uh, some very real issues happening globally that have changed a little bit, maybe the priority or made it harder to reach some of these goals. In your view, who are the actors who are doing the most in order to make this happen? And also, do you think that we have the right narratives to really push these goals forward um, and in, in helping us change how we think about these issues to be able to reach the goals and to be able to um, count this intergenerational justice as a starting point for everything we do? Well, to be very short, uh, with a tough sentence, if you wish, uh, I think that we are using uh, wrong data, wrong models, wrong theories. You know the movie Oppenheimer about building the first uh, bomb, the nuclear bomb? If they had our data, our models, our theory, would never be able, would have never been able to do that. What do I mean by this? First of all, uh, uh, we have, uh, um, in terms of uh, statistics, but statistics drive policies, this focus on uh, GDP, the uh, gross domestic product that was invented by the US government in 1944 and then exported to the rest of the world as a yardstick to understand whether we are going in the right direction or not. And in fact, it w we went in the right direction until the moment in which uh, we tried to export the model that were, was used by Western countries to the entire world. And uh, we recognized that uh, nature is not an infinite uh, thing and uh, many other problems. But you know the sentence which says, if you think uh, that something like GDP 
could grow in, indefinitely within a finite space like this planet, you must be either stupid or an economist. And therefore, we have been following uh, this mantra of growth uh, and the theory that we are using since the beginning of the 80s with the neoliberal, let's say, uh, revolution doesn't include anything in terms of uh, distribution, inequalities. Our th economic theory that we used and we thought to students doesn't talk at all about uh, inequality. La while at the beginning of the 70s, when I was studying economics, this was one of the issues that had to be addressed by economic theory. Let me also add that we are using models which uh, econometric models, for example, to evaluate the impact of different policies, which are intrinsically linear, while the natural world evolves uh, in a non-linear way. And now that we are reaching the tipping points where the scientists show that uh, we risk to have uh, intersections, interactions of natural systems, but also social and economic systems in a quite uh, sudden changes, our models are inadequate. So it's quite difficult to fix this, this problem with wrong data, wrong theory, and wrong models. Notwithstanding that, uh, European Union, since 2019, uh, with the current legislature, just uh, for a few weeks, uh, made a great choice. Uh, it put the 2030 agenda at the core of policies. All new legislations, directives, plans had to be tested before they are presented in terms of impact of different SDGs. But more than that, the development of integrated economic, social, environmental models allow Europe to simulate better than before alternative policies. But then, as you may know, the, the group of people which the, the most uh, resistant to what I'm talking about are male with more than 50 years. So 50 years old men are really the most uh, uh, negative on this kind of approach because they were um, trained in wrong models, wrong data, wrong theory. So it's very tough and difficult to change this way of thinking. The technology of the past is seen as one of the essential elements of an unsustainable development model. And technology of the future could be a solution to regain a sustainable development. In this context, how can we address the role of artificial intelligence? Without uh, a jump in terms of technologies, in terms of governance, in terms of culture, we will never able to move uh, to towards a sustainable pathway. Therefore, new technologies are vital for making this change. Not only energy technologies, but uh, all types of technologies, including uh, the digital ones. Artificial intelligence, uh, uh, I'm not necessarily an expert uh, in this field, can find new solutions, and we see already in the medicine field, uh, in the research, um, that uh, it is able to make connections that researchers were not able to, to make. On the other hand, we were discussing uh, uh, just this morning this point, is that uh, uh, artificial intelligence normally uses what is already available. And uh, uh, this could slow down in a certain extent uh, to find uh, um, new solutions just because uh, the tendency is to replicate all the answers to uh, new questions. Uh, you may remember that uh, um, the very, very uh, important person who changed our lives uh, um, 
a great scientist said once uh, that uh, we cannot solve uh, all problems uh, uh, without changing uh, our models, our uh, way of uh, thinking. So the risk of inter uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithms is just to replicate past wrong uh, choices. This is where we need to invest a lot also to find, uh, I would say, um, quantum leap in terms of solutions, overcoming uh, what uh, uh, the researchers are able to do right now. And there are good news from this point of view. I really like what you say. When we, well, like is maybe the wrong word, but find it interesting that you say we don't have the right data, we don't have the right theories, and we don't have the right models. Because, of course, um, as you can infer from our name at Reimagine Europe, but this is often the starting point of all our, our thinking, and we find that this is the case on most topics. Um, and then my question is, where do you think we can see kind of the, the, the start of new thinking, which organizations or which people, maybe which countries are starting to think differently? So um, you talked about the European Union and the big kind of the, the, the good work that has been done these past five years in really putting sustainability at the center of the agenda. As you know, we now have the elections in a couple of weeks time. And um, many of the words are different in the public um, rhetoric this time around. It's about competitiveness. It's about growth, as you mentioned, and very much words that echoes um, the situation 10 years ago rather than five years ago. Do you see the, this as a major challenge in terms of people actually trying to revert backwards as opposed to moving forward and starting to see these um, policies and these choices not only as sacrifices and as kind of things that we do for the global good, but actually that there's a smart thing in this to create sustainability? And here, obviously, we mean social, we mean economic and not only environmental, is a different way of thinking about that, things that can be actually bring Europe to be more competitive in the long run by, by changing models. Do you think you're starting to see somewhere that this is happening or are we reverting backwards? I'm sorry for the long and quite wordy question, but I'd be very interested to hear your views on this um, and if you're hopeful towards looking towards the future. Well, uh, let me tell you a short story. Uh, in 2014, uh, after stepping down as Minister of Labour, I was asked uh, by the European Commission to be a consultant uh, to the think tank uh, that was working for the president of the Commission, Juncker. And after one year of work, uh, I organized a conference on uh, sustainable development and resilience. After uh, the conference, I was told by the head of cabinet of President Juncker that I had to stop talking about those concepts because the European Commission would have never embraced them. So a few years later, the UN, uh, the, sorry, the EU decided uh, to embrace the 2030 agenda. And uh, in 2020, um, in front of the pandemic, they decided to use uh, the resilience framework that we had developed uh, at the European Commission after I left the that think tank and we i started working with the joint research center of the european commission and now resilience is everywhere is a new compass of uh, uh, european policies according to what has been even written in the new stability and growth pact what i mean is that uh, uh, it can change uh, quickly in one side in one direction or the other direction and this is where policymakers, politicians, and people have uh, an incredible role to play. On the other hand, uh, I would like to underline that uh, the private sector had decided to go in this direction for an issue of competitiveness, for an issue of growth, for an issue of uh, future. The OECD recently published a report with long-term forecasts at, until uh, 200, 2100. And again, we are facing the risk in developed countries of the secular stagnation, which means more or less 1% increase of GDP per year. 
which will not lead us anywhere. So capitalism has also, from time to time, uh, a desperate need for new waves of investments, new pressure, no, new push. And I think that the ecological and digital transition is exactly what is needed in this perspective. And also the simulations that we have recently published uh, as Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development show that if you just look at the uh, energy transition, the result is barely equal to not doing anything by 2030, 2050, even uh, a little bit loss in terms of GDP and employment. But if you take the opportunity of the energy transition for a huge investment in innovation at uh, 360 degrees level, then uh, you have an increase in GDP, you have an increase in uh, uh, employment. So this is the point where we are. Of course, we can decide to wait, but again, according to the simulations, it's worse because the costs will be much higher. And we see with China and now other countries that they took seriously the transition technological and therefore they investing a huge amount of money and we lose to lose our we risk to lose our competitiveness our future therefore i really hope that europe will listen to what for example mario draghi said recently in an event uh, close to brussels and like ulpe where also myself and the former prime minister enrico letta uh, gave a speech where we where um, draghi said we need uh, 500 billion investment per year to uh, uh, revert this kind of trends. And there isn't any single country that could make it successfully. This is an investment on future. This would require common debt, but also common uh, revenues. And I hope that Europe will go in this direction. As, if I, as I see, we have time for a last question, if, if, um, if I may. Um, I fully agree, and I especially like this thing that you're mentioning about the importance of um, coupling sustainability and innovation. What we've seen with our narrative studies that unfortunately a lot of narratives put sustainability as an opposite for innovation. And whilst we know that we actually need, we need both. We need innovation for sustainability. So um, I think this is, is a really important point to underline. Um, and the fact that this Big investment can also be the big investment for the future industries and for the future growth and um, development of um, the European uh, economy and also maybe the global economy as we are moving towards a more global world. If you had a magic wand and could make one thing happen today to influence the future policies of um, on sustainability, what's the one thing that you would advise, whether it's the future European institutions or um, uh, the the summit of uh, the future is coming up in, in, in September. What's the one thing that you think would be the most important to drive this agenda forward? Change the system of national accounts. And uh, this was one of the proposals made by the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, for the summit of the future, but is the only one which was put aside. And I'm very uh, disappointed if not upset. And the reason is very simple. We are talking uh, since uh, 20 years ago when I was chief statistician at the OECD to make this change. Because without changing the metric which leads our actions that rewards politicians, rewards uh, policymakers and so on, there is no way to change uh, the capitalism towards another phase of capitalism, which is what we need. From this point of view, I'm very disappointed because, uh, as I underlined in a recent uh, meeting of the G7 women here in Italy, is that uh, we expect that women behave differently from uh, men in several respects. And one of them 
should have been exactly this one. We have uh, a woman who is uh, head of the uh, European Commission, a woman who is head of IMF, the Deputy Secretary General of UN is a woman, OECD and World Bank have uh, male as Secretary General, but anyway, two and a half plus the Secretary General of UN should have been strongly in favor of changing this. And uh, on the contrary, it didn't fly. And I think that from the European Union, we have a vital interest in this respect. Why? Because as we have put sustainable development, not just growth, at the center of our development paradigm, and we are judged by the rest of the world only in terms of GDP, there is no way for us to show that what is written in Article 3 of the Treaty of the European Union, which quotes sustainable development twice, produces be best, better outcomes for the environment, for people, for the economies. You see what I mean? We are... Uh, we should build our model, we have built our model on different concepts and we are still evaluated according to the old ones. So it's in our political interest to show that we are much better in terms of well-being, sustainability, equality. It's a political issue, as you see, it's not a statistical issue. Well, thank you very much. So. Just to summarize very brief, briefly, what we are, what we end up counting is what ends up counting. Um, so I think this is a very important uh, message to keep and to really also maybe encourage young people to say, now with these new tools that we have with big data and AI and things, can we think of a radically different way of counting things so things we care about start counting more? Yes, it's correct. Thank you very much. Thank you.